How do you follow up the most Tim burton -y movie that Tim Burton never directed? By reviewing the most Tim burton -y movie that Tim Burton did direct. This week we're doing Sleepy Hollow, starring Johnny Depp, obviously. Adapted from the book The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving, this is classic Tim Burton. Gothic designs, over-the-top dramatic landscapes, and bizarre cast of characters. So I just noticed when I rewatched this film for the podcast, the ensemble cast in this oh, is... the cast is so it's, good. It's brilliant, man. You've got the gay uncle from With No and I, Dumbledore, the British dickhead from Last of the Mohicans, Ferris Bueller's teacher, Nukem Rico, Alfred from Batman, and Emperor Palpatine. Yeah, well, speaking of Sith Lords, you've actually got three in this movie. You've got, obviously, Emperor Palpatine, like you just said. Mm. you also got Christopher Lee shows up in the opening scene. His career was actually flagging a lot during this period. And Tim Burton, obviously a huge fan of him, huge fan of horror Hammer movies. And he partly, he felt like he was trying to make a Hammer horror movie with this movie. So that's part of the reason why, that's the main reason why he cast Christopher Lee for an opening cameo even though he gets top billing in the credits. But also, he filmed the entire movie in England. And he was doing all these things to try and channel and get into more of the vibe and atmosphere of a Hammer horror movie, which I think he nails mm -hmm. in every department in this film. And the other one was Darth Maul. So Darth Maul, the fellow who plays Darth Maul in Phantom Menace was actually a stunt coordinator and stunt actor, stunt performer. And he ended up getting the role, actually, of performing as Darth Maul. In this, he shares the role of the Headless Horseman with Christopher Walken. Any of the times he doesn't have his head on screen, which is most of the time, you're actually seeing Ray Park. So the sets in this film are just beautiful. And at the time, it was the biggest set ever created in the UK. In fact, some of the sets were so big that they had to be built outside in the end. The windmill, which comes towards the climax of the movie, was five stories high and there was no sound stage in the whole of the UK that could take that. So they had to build that outside. The, the Westwood Forest is entirely sets. By the end of the shoot, they'd nearly turned into a real forest because it was infested with insects. Birds were beginning to nest in the fake branches and the whole thing was getting overtaken. And it became a real problem on set with animals. They constantly had people on pest control. And it actually got used in the movie later when you see he gets really scared oh, yeah. at the sight of a spider. And that was because Every day they had a guy filling up jars and filling up containers with bugs that he was removing from set. So in the end they thought we may as well just use this. Yeah. That's that's mad man. Like obviously I totally understand the vibe they're trying to get. They get that perfectly with like the little villages they created. But surely they could have found like a real forest. Surely it would have been cheaper to like just use an actual forest in I'm England. Oh, like. I'm sure it would have been <laughs> infinitely cheaper. And they, of course, do do <laughs> use real forests for certain moments. Yeah. Like the opening shots as Johnny Depp's character comes into Sleepy Hollow Village. But first of all, you couldn't capture that gothic, otherworldly sort yeah. of forest that Tim Burton was yeah, trying yeah. to create. But another reason is, is doing that gave them the ability to control every aspect of the atmosphere, the lighting and the weather at all times. For Tim Burton, that meant it was like a blank canvas that he could control every detail of in order to get his exact vision mm. on the screen. You know, imagine being able to control the weather. It's kind of like having a practical version of CGI where you literally can control everything. Yeah. You're not relying on the real elements. Because in this film, obviously, it's deliberately dreary while that they're, they're hunting mm. the horsemen like constant grey black skies and I guess if you're going on actual forests it might be sunny so you're like well, yeah this doesn't, exactly oh so that does make sense yeah. and in fact they used the blue filters over the camera lenses at all times when they were filming exterior shots to keep continuity of that really sort of greyish bluish dreary tones that the movie visually portrays itself but because of that Whenever you have exterior shots and they were using blood, which of course in this movie there's a hell there's of a lot, lot of blood, yeah, yeah. they actually had to have it translucent orange so that through the lens oh, it really? would come up as red. And you can see that in certain moments, like the bat scene where the bat is getting his yeah. head cut off when the mysterious lady in the woods is doing a spell. You can actually see that it, it must have been the same blood because it's not quite, it's sort of an exterior shot, but it's an exterior set and they're inside and you can kind of see a orange tint to the blood yeah i guess uh again i'm gonna touch on that point 
I guess by doing stuff like this, like practical stuff, actually using a physical dye, they save so much time on post-production because I assume that even if it wasn't quite red, there's there's someone like a colorist that could change it to red mm. post-production. But I guess it's not the same as a proper practical kind of thing. Yeah, and you could say that about every element of this movie because yeah. Tim Burton became a lot more reliant and embracing of CGI as the years yeah. went on. And partly that's just because it became more normalised in the industry. But everything about this movie suits practical effects. Yeah. Like there's a there's a cartoonish physicality to everything. You know, when someone pretending to be the Headless Horseman throws a flaming pumpkin at Johnny Depp, the physics of it flying through the air don't look right. But it suits the movie. Yeah. The way heads are cut off in the movie, and there's a lot of beheading in the movie. Yeah. The physics of it don't look right. They don't look authentic to the real world. It's nearly like heads, you know, the knife cuts through the neck and bone like butter, and the mm. heads seem to pop off yeah. like they're like a champagne cork. But it suits the universe of the movie. Like it suits the it suits a Tim Burton movie. It makes sense I in this universe. I've seen this film numerous times. But I haven't seen it for a while, and I actually did forget how violent it was. So I was like, "Fucking hell!" It's hot. incredibly it, violent. It's literally heads. The original out. script was actually a lot more violent again, and yeah. they toned it down. And one of the things that it was kind of controversy between the producers and the director, even even Tim Burton, kind of felt at some point when the British dickhead from Last of the Mohicans and his family are being killed, they were they're if in an R and a lot about whether to kill the kid. Yeah. And eventually they settled on killing him off screen. And I always think that's a great move. There's something about when a movie... It's the Jaws effect where when you kill a child early in a movie, it's one of the few things you can still do to shock a modern audience. Yeah, yeah. And it makes you realise, like, anyone's up for grabs. They've done it, yeah. The way they've done it in the film was really clever. Like Fantastic sequence. Obviously, he's under the floor and then the horseman. You're like... If, if you were seeing it for the first time, you're like, yes, he's he's walking off. He's... And then he kind of like just turns around and you're like, oh no, like you don't see it, it's off screen, but you just see him drop something into his headband and you're like, oh, poor you know, ginger his, kid. His head. <laughs> uh, Speaking just, of which, how, I want, like, how does the Headless Horseman sense? Because he's got no sensory organs other than touch. Because, you know, his mm. ears are gone, his eyes are gone. I don't know, I think it's just kind of some kind of like... Magic, kind magical of telekinesis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he's compelled towards a certain direction. I probably think so because it can't be smell <laughs> mm. or anything like that. It's got to be. There's a big theme in this with witchcraft and magic. Obviously, I was thinking just the way that he's the the skull powers him. I think is just built into that ritual. Mm. Is my opinion. <laughs> Early on in the movie, we get the Johnny Depp's come to town to Sleepy Hollow, and we learn the myth of the headless horseman, Christopher Walken, never looking more scary than in this, Fucking hell, with his yeah. sharpened teeth and his crazy hairstyle, actually piercing eyes. Mm. He is essentially a. I think they said that he was a German who had come over, hired by the British to fight the revolutionaries, and he seems to just revel in chaos. You know, he's going around beheading revolutionaries and running into battle single-handedly but we see him he gets chased off into the woods encounters two little girls and then is eventually beheaded yeah not before absolutely fucking up about 10 dudes <laughs> yeah no he's massive <laughs> in which the fighting that choreography in this movie is just brilliant as well i just yeah. love like Physically, you just feel like with any swoop, you could cut an arm off or a head's yeah. going to pop off or a limb or a leg. People get entirely cut in half at moments in this movie. So anyway, he gets his head cut off and he's buried there and that sort of creates the myth of the headless horseman. Johnny Depp arrives and he is he is a scientist. We see in the opening sequence with Christopher Lee, he's frustrated by how progressive and modern thinking he is and how backwards the rest of the population is when it comes to police work and detective work. So he comes into town after hearing there's been three murders in Sleepy Hollow in the space of two weeks and immediately he's told by everyone that it's by a headless horseman, which he dismisses outright. He thinks it's absolutely yeah. ridiculous. Until he sees the headless horseman himself. 
he witnesses the murder of the gay uncle from With Nail and I. <laughs> It would be funny if he just went, oh, my boy, my <laughs> boy, uh, to the headless horse, and I mean to have you. <laughs> I was quite gutted, actually, because he meets, um, he meets all the characters early on, and I kind of got the impression at first that he was going to be a prick, but he very quickly turns out to be a bit of an ally, and he's trying to help Johnny Depp in his case. And he's about to reveal an important detail that one of the people murdered was pregnant. Before he can reveal the father, the headless horseman comes out of the woods, cuts off his head. It lands between Johnny Depp's legs. And then yeah. uh, he impels it and runs off back into the woods. What did you think of this transition from Johnny Depp being so freaked out that he couldn't believe in it and he wanted to leave straight away to just embracing the fact that this obviously was a supernatural being? I thought it was a bit stupid because like the way... It's a recurrent theme in it where he keeps fainting all the time. And, like, <laughs> yeah. if he did really see that headless horseman, him and I'm going to say 100% of people would be like, you're not fucking paying me enough for this. <laughs> I'm out of here, man. Because, like, at the end of the day, he's come to the town to, to, you know, investigate this. He doesn't know any of the background stories to why it's happening. So the target's not on him. I would be like, fuck this, I'm gone, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm out, fair I'm enough. Out of here. I have faced my fears and come out determined to locate the horseman's grave, to pit myself against a murdering ghost. Who's with me? Me. But other than the fact that would you just get scared and leave, I actually kind of thought afterwards, at first I was like, that was way too quick, but when I thought mm. about him more, it actually is very in keeping with his character, because he is completely everything's logical everything's rational everything's scientific everything's if i see it i'll believe it so he sees something supernatural and he's after a minute thinking about it, he's like okay i believe it i've seen it i know this is yeah, the case yeah, yeah. so this is what i'm dealing with so i'm going to approach it from that angle from now on constable crane ichabod crane is that you none other i was kind of like comparing it to like when we was watching from hell because mm. even though they're both detectives Johnny Depp's a detective in both this kind of detective is kind of like the opposite to his from hell one Mm. because the from hell one is all about you know like law when he has like the two like pennies on the eyes and it's like they're getting taken you need to do it because they're never cross passage and stuff whereas Ichabod Crane is so logical and I just like the fact that well, they're they also, were so different they're also so well. different in that Johnny Depp's character in From Hell is a cool cool yeah. customer yeah, yeah, yeah. who relies on paranormal visions yes whereas like you said this guy relies on rational logic and scientific methods progressive yeah. scientific methods of the time but is a complete nervous wreck completely neurotic constantly fainting like you said at yeah, the sight yeah. of blood at the sight of spiders at the sight of a man being beheaded by a headless horseman which is fair enough yeah one. yeah i think most people would yeah but, but yeah it is interesting seeing the parallel between those characters and it's interesting because knowing like we did last week that he was kind of wary of taking on the role because he felt it was too similar but yeah yeah superficially it's similar but it's actually wildly different but i also want to touch on when i was watching it I don't think anyone else apart from Johnny Depp could have played this character. Mm. I'm like, it just it just suits Johnny Depp. I can't see it as anyone else. He I, plays it so well. I don't think it would have ever been anyone else as well. Yeah. It's a Tim Burton movie and he always, he loves always. It, yeah. I think they spoke to, the studio spoke to Daniel Day-Lewis, but it was more of a formality. Right. They just thought, you know, just in case Johnny Depp falls out, we need backups. But it was, Johnny Depp was born to do this. <laughs> So Johnny Depp heads off with his little psychic into the woods and they come across this old sort of ha- bizarre looking house in the woods and there's this really creepy woman living in there who immediately, she's giving you the vibe of she's a witch and she's done all this bad stuff yeah. and it's her but it's 30 minutes into the movie so you know she's not. Yeah, basically. yeah, 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 yeah. She sends the boy outside and she seems to cast some bizarre spell in which she is possessed momentarily but she chains herself up for her so she can't hurt Johnny Depp and by possessing herself this whoever this entity that possesses her reveals some clues to Johnny Depp 
And these clues lead him to the Tree of the Dead, which yes. is what a great set. It was really cool when they cut into it, the blood effects and oh, stuff. Like, just fantastic. It was just, it was just vintage Tim Burton. It's just beautiful. <laughs> and again, we speak a lot about when you want to see that it's a movie mm. and you immediately know that's a set, but it's perfect. Like it, it, it's, you know, that's not a tree that exists in real life. Even okay. though it always reminded me of a tree that was next to our school growing up. Fuck not, I hope it doesn't yeah. exist in real life. <laughs> and at, by this point, he's been joined by Christina Ricci's character, who their romance is already starting to bud in classic 18th century era way where they just, they're in love within like two meetings of each other. But that's fine, you believe in it. I, I really like the chemistry between these, even though Johnny Depp was kind of disturbed when he first found out that she was going to be his love interest because he first met her on a set of The Mermaids when she was nine years old because he was dating Weona Ryder at the time who was starring in that movie. Which is pretty weird, actually, when you think about it. It must have been quite disturbing for him. But he clearly got over it. Yeah, because he kisses like someone he knew as a nine-year-old kid. Yeah, it's pretty fucked up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But but that's what actors do. They get through it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, You know, actors kiss. You know, straight actors have gay kissing scenes at times. You just do it, I guess. Actors, you know, it's a different mentality, I guess. And he's getting a fuckload of money. True, true, <laughs> yeah. good point. Definitely so I, I, I just forget about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, so they start chopping into the tree, and like you said, it's a great effect with all the blood and gauze coming out, and it reveals all the heads tumble out, yeah. all the heads that the headless horseman's been collecting. So Johnny Depp's character's trying to like deduce, like, what is this? Why is this happening? Like, is he trying to find his own head? Is you know, is he is he doing this? They dig up the site where he was buried, and they find a skeleton, but his head is missing. Yeah. So he starts thinking, what if someone's taken his head, dug it up, taken his skull, because they can see the soils, the earth has already been disturbed, so mm. someone's dug this up clearly, and taken his skull. So what if the person who's taken his skull is using it to magically control the headless horseman? That is why the horseman returns from the grave. He take heads to his own, is restored to him. When you break it down, like the detective work is... He doesn't really do much. He he essentially the witch who gets possessed tells him where to find the yeah, yeah, tree, yeah. and then he just magically works out the entire plot. Basically, once he finds no, the tree. No, to be fair, to be fair, like if you did see a skeleton and its and its skull wasn't there, you would be like, well, any like normal person would be like, hang on, there's no head to it. Like, but to connect it to yeah is difficult. But then you, you go got with it. you got to think, Declan. Hang on, this horseman don't have a head, and this his physical body don't have a head. Mm. <laughs> right, but yeah, if if you're being yeah, chased, point. if good you're point. yeah, but if you're being chased by it, I wouldn't be able to think straight. Of like, yeah, you shoot your <laughs> yeah, yeah. right at it. Like, for fuck's sake, like. <laughs> Yeah. So this leads into a great sequence, probably my favourite sequence in the whole movie, where you see the headless horseman breaks into British Dickhead's family's home from the last Mohicans, kills everyone, and is going out. And Newcomb Rico and Johnny Depp start fighting with him. And it's really interesting. This is where Johnny Depp first actually starts to put together that it's being controlled to not kill at random, but to mm. kill specific targets every night. Because it's not interested in him. It has a Terminator nearly sort of vibe where it just walks past them. If you start fighting him, he'll immediately pull his sword out and fight you. Kill you if he needs to. But if he just gets you to go off or run away, he'll just continue on walking. He's yeah. not interested. Yeah, I was a bit pissed off about Nugan Rico, man. It's like, there's no need for you. It's like, it's like he wanted to do it to like essentially show off. He's like, I can take him. <laughs> yeah, he was, you know what I, mean? I like characters like this where he's not a pivotal character but he's not just a prick he has prickish elements he's a little bit mate guarding of Christina Ricci towards yeah. Johnny Depp because obviously they have a sort of kindling romance themselves he is a little bit proud and a little bit arrogant but he's also very brave and very protective of his town and yeah, trying to yeah. do the right thing yeah. so I really like his character and like you said, sadly, he gets cut in half. He's chopped in half. Not, not soon after this. Which, which is exactly like Darth Maul does to Qui Gon Jinn. Oh, shit. Sure, yeah. That spins around. Good shout. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. If that was a little shout. Yeah, yeah. A little, little cameo kind he of He actually thing. broke his finger during the three way axe fight with the. Oh, really? And he pre- didn't say anything and just continued on, even though he was in agony, because he was afraid that the scene would be cut. 
And without that oh. scene, he was not going to be a memorable character beyond that. Although he has, does have another memorable moment where he pretends to be the headless horseman early on and throws the burning pumpkin Good at Johnny point. Depp. Yeah, but yeah. other than that, it easily he was smart because easily that sequence could have got way cut down or cut out. Oh yeah, and he would have just not been in the movie. Yeah, yeah. So at this point, you have the headless horseman runs off after killing Nuke and Rico, and Johnny Depp's character is stabbed and is kind of out of it for the next day or two. And he's been looked after by Christina Ricci and her dad but it's getting a bit complicated because he start as he's doing his detective work he's starting to realize there's a bit of a conspiracy in town over his inheritance because he's the richest man in town it seems to lead towards the fact that his inheritance and who his money is going to be left for is the reason people are being killed off it's so fucking like weird like everything is always about money isn't it yeah. <laughs> literally like just everyone's so obsessed with money in real life and in films. It's like, I'll just kill 30 people just to get a bit of yeah. money. Yeah, <laughs> we'll leave, Yeah, they say. yeah. So he's uncovering things and this is creating a tension between him and Christina Ricci. And that's, you know, pulling at his heartstrings a little bit. But, you know, his mind overpowers that because he is a guy who thinks logically and he knows he has to do this. So we get to a point where several people have been killed off. Everyone in town is getting together in the church in order to protest it I Johnny think, Depp yeah I think discuss what's going on Frame. but also protest against Johnny Depp's involvement I don't really get why they were protesting him particularly but yeah neither do I he's trying to pe- help like. people are scared and just it just suited the plot at the time Christine Enrique's wicked stepmother gets seemingly killed according to Dumbledore yeah and he rides back into town and says the the headless horseman is here and everyone gets into the church and it's a great action sequence as he's tr- he's riding around the church he can't enter wasn't sure if he couldn't enter because it's a church or because of christina Ricci's pentagram design that she sets on the floor because she is she's kind of the inverse of johnny depp's character as well where he does everything by logic she believes in magic and spells and take this it is my gift for you no i have no use for are you so certain of everything? I I think, personally, I was thinking about this. I think it's because it's a church. Because her mm. pentagram thing, later on, Johnny Depp looks in the little book that she gives him mm. and sees the pentagram, and the spell is for the protection of loved ones. But that spell did not work, as we see later on, because poor old Dumbledore gets well he killed no but he can't enter but it's it's the protection oh, right. but he can't yeah, enter yeah, yeah, now you yeah, might yeah, be yeah, right yeah, yeah, yeah. but i feel like why would they right, include right, it right, in the right. movie although actually it might have been included in the movie as because it was johnny depp earlier when he's scared of the spider finds a pentagram under his bed but he doesn't know it's a good pentagram so at this point he thinks maybe that she is also not to be trusted and the audience if it's the first time you yeah, see yeah, it yeah 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 but him then reading that point. and seeing it's the same pentagram that she drew, he realises that, no, she did have good intentions. I think it actually saying that, I think it was something to do with her because remember when it first goes into the church, it does something to the soil. Someone's moved the soil around, which I assume was her. And it, and it, right? And, it, and, and he kind of like steps down on it and then goes backwards. Yeah. So I think... It was Christina Ricci, basically, yeah. yeah. But yeah. like you said, it doesn't say Dumbledore. So before Dumbledore yeah. dies, some of the other high-up elders in the village reveal to him that there was a conspiracy effort. Well, one of them is trying to reveal it before he gets a crucifix banged on his head. Time to confess our sins. What is it that you know? Your four friends played you false. We were devilishly possessed by one who... <laughs> yeah. And then the other guy gets shot. But you realise at that point, and Johnny Depp realises that, Christina Ricci's dad, most richest man in town, isn't in on the conspiracy, and he's none the wiser. Yeah. And at that moment, such I always this is so memorable for me as a kid, where the headless horseman he's running around outside and getting shot at, and he grabs one of the picket fences posts, ties a rope around it, throws it through like a fucking spearhead. Yeah. Through the window, impaling Dumbledore. It pulls him out of the church window. Drags him along until he's out of the church grounds and cuts his head off. Yeah. And heads into the woods. So now we're setting up for the final big showdown. So there's a bit of misdirection, obviously, with the fact that it seems like the stepmother's killed. 
But yes. y- you just film language before that, the way she's looking at the camera, she's acted a bit weird about Johnny Depp seeing her cut her own hand on purpose. Yeah. yeah. You know she's the bad guy, basically, yeah, yeah, at this yeah. point. Yeah. So it skips along, and Johnny Depp's about to leave town, but he says, fuck that, I need to do the right thing. Comes back, he realises that the woman, the body of the stepmother, isn't actually her. Yeah. Because basically, the body also has the cut, but it is still open, still raw, so he deduces that this cut was made after she was dead, because Mm. obviously when you die, the body's dead, and it's not going to activate any of the, you know, blood cells or whatever to heal it up. Yes. And it turned out to be the sexy chambermaid, who I really liked as well. She was wealthy, She was gorgeous. (laughs) Yeah. So she gets her head clopped off by... So, Christina Ricci gets kidnapped, taken to that amazing big five-story windmill set, and we have the classic villain reveals all of the plan before they kill you. Yeah, And she yeah, explains yeah. that she was the one of the two little sisters who Christopher Walken saw in the woods before he had his head cut off. And when she saw him get thrown into the ground, she said she'd sell her soul to Satan if the headless horseman would rise up and help her strike vengeance. Because she hated the richest family in town, the one who she eventually supplanted the wife of, who she she herself killed, yeah, it turns yeah, out, yeah. and eventually became the wife of. She hated them because they were the richest people in town and they cast them out in order to give someone else her family home. Yeah, they had yeah, to yeah. live in the woods. At that moment, I offered my soul to Satan if he would raise the Hessian from the grave to avenge me. You realise then, her twin sister is, of course, the other woman in the woods, who you at first think is the villain, or at least think is villainous. She is also killed, it shows, in a flashback by her sister. So this chick has just killed everyone. I've got to give it to the evil stepmom bitch, because, like, talk about holding a grudge, because, like, Mm. I'm good at holding grudges, but she's held it since she was a little kid until now. And, like, you know, she probably, like... It's got another house in between and yeah. shit, but she's like, fuck them oh, still. still. She's yeah, like, it's yeah, not good yeah. enough, I'm killing everyone. Yeah. And fantastic visual storytelling is if you then think back to the moment in the woods where the two little girls' reactions. You have one is that throws her sticks down and runs away scared. The other intentionally snaps the twig to alert the nearby men so that the headless horseman is killed. Just a simple little difference in how they react that completely tells everything about their personality. They do, they do say that about twins. One's 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 more, evil. One's more, <laughs> no, one's always that. more evil than the other. Do you know <laughs> do they, I mean? Who says that? Well, I don't know. I just made it up. <laughs> who says that about? I don't twins? actually know any twins. <laughs> I'll have to test it out. <laughs> one's always evil. And it always reminds me of that Treehouse of Horror. Yeah, Bart's, Bart's evil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah, yeah, grotesque. Maybe, and then they have to swap. Yeah, eat, maybe I just got it from that. Eat your fish heads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so. Of course, Johnny Tepp runs to the rescue, and while that she does her spell, and the headless horseman arrives at the windmill, and Johnny Depp has the great idea where they climb up, lead the headless horseman all the way to the top, and then set it all on fire, and they climb out the top, carry down yeah, on the windmill, that was, that was and escape. Cool, but naturally, you know there's 20 minutes in the movie left, so the headless, headless horseman ain't dead yet. Well, he's already dead. He's That's already dead, yeah. So they have a yeah. they have a really good chase scene, and this chase scene apparently took three weeks to film and was a bit of a nightmare. And most of the coolest ideas Tim Burton had for it didn't end up happening on account of you know he wanted the headless horseman to be on fire while he was chasing them the whole time, but they just couldn't do it safely with all the sets and uh, all manner of things that he didn't end up getting to do. But it was still one of the coolest parts of the whole movie. My only big problem with it is. Johnny Depp wears an awful lot of plot armour. You know, the Headless Horseman easily takes down people at a whim. You know, lots yeah. off heads while running on full pelt on a horse. But he just miraculously can't, keeps missing Johnny Depp for about 10 minutes. It's like, it's like James Bond, isn't it? Like, he'll be in a, he'll be in a room or with like 100 soldiers and they'll be running and like all their, every single bullet is just hitting the pillars yeah. and missing him. But that thing you just said about the fire makes perfect sense because I said it when we were just watching the movie. Like, the fucking... Number one, the windmill just explodes. (laughs) 
Yeah, it's just, why is it exploding? Like, unless there's like gunpowder in there or something, it's on it fire be. and it just explodes. And then he comes out and I turn around to him and it's like, wait, he just walked through fire and he's not even on fire. Like yeah. literally, so they must have had it for him to be on yeah. fire in the chase. So Which would have been that made, awesome. That would have been fucking Oh, it would have been amazing. Yeah, yeah. So they get back to the Tree of the Dead and the Headless Horseman's after Christina Ricci at this point. So the stepmother bitch shows up. They have their big showdown. They're fighting each other. They're fighting the horseman. You know, they're going back and forth. And the stepmother kind of beats up Johnny Depp, even, which is kind yeah, of fun. She does. In keeping with the character. She does. Uh, but just as the headless horseman grabs Christina Reek and he's about to cut her head off, he grabs the skull from the stepmother and throws it over to the headless horseman. And I like, I always like that. It looks a bit ropey now. It looks a little bit, you know, dodgy CG a la Mars Attacks. But I do still love the effect of all the muscle strands oh, starting to it. reapply to the skeletal head. It just works. It's kind of um, a reverse Indiana Jones. Mm, yeah, like yeah. When their face melts, yeah. it's like the other way around. Would like, you wonder, could you know they have mean? done the same practical effect and then reversed it? Oh, mate. Rather than CGI. Hell. I remember seeing that in Indiana Jones where it fucking yeah. terrified me. <laughs> That's yeah. another great yeah. special effect you know isn't real, but it's nearly more disturbing yeah, yeah, because yeah. of it. Yeah. And we get to see Christopher Walken again, which incidentally, he doesn't have a single line of dialogue in this, does he? No, realized. he doesn't. He doesn't. But he does... just, he's just there for the look. But he does have a big full on kiss. Grabs the evil bitch stepmother, gives her. A... I remember all... this always disturbed me as well. He gives her a massive kiss. And you start to see blood streaming down oh, her face yeah, as he's kissing her. Because he's obviously kissing her, but also slicing her lips oh, up and her tongue up with his teeth. Oh, oh. And him, his horse, and the stepmother run back and ride and disappear into the tree of the dead. Amongst blood and guts coming out of the tree and disappear. Well, yeah, he's, he's, as you said, he's taking her to hell. Which, Yeah, I assume he's which... taking her back to hell. Because she did say she sold her soul to the devil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. And it ends with her hand is kind of sticking out of the tree. And I always wanted a sequel where she... Something about, you know, the handless woman or something. Yeah. You know, some sort of sequel. Because you said the exact same thing. We were watching the movie before and we nearly thought at the same time where we thought, I want to see the next movie where they're in New York. Yeah, yeah, Christina yeah. Christina Ricci and they're walking through New York. And they're and little psychic. They encounter another... Um, bizarre mystery or another yeah piece they could of something have, going on it could have been like a kind of like a series because i thought they had tried to set it up like that because th- they get off in like new york and then archibald crane goes to christina Ricci and the little kid like you'll get used to it in time my the, the bronx is up here and my house is this way and i was thinking obviously Tim Burton might not have directed it. It wouldn't really work if it wasn't him, to be honest. But the three of them is kind of like a Scooby-Doo kind of paranormal investigating trio. Like, I'm trying to think of, like, other mythical yeah, creatures they could, like, you investigate. You know, a swamp thing or whatever. Well, yeah, exactly. That could have been good. Like you know, they... Vampires. Dracula. Oh, that would have been yeah, sick. Bring back uh, yeah. Christopher Lee. They they go they go to Transylvania, the yeah. three of them, and werewolves. Whatever. Fucking Hugh Jackman turns up as Van Helsing, like as some weird yeah. crossover. Yeah, that's that would have been a sick. I, I honestly, I wanted it. Oh, at the end, Mate, I was like, imagine Van Helsing. Obviously, the Hugh Jackman one. I like it. I like it. As it's, well. it's, I, it's, I got it's, a soft every, spot. Everyone's it. like, oh shit! But imagine fucking Tim Burton doing a Van Helsing. Set in Do you know what? I wouldn't need Van Helsing. I want this character again. Like I yeah. like the trio. I like the style of it. Yeah, it was perfect. Saying that, it's, it's, it feels nearly weird that Tim Burton's never done a Van Helsing movie. Yeah, that'd have been so sick. Like he could have had the whole Jackal and Hyde in it. Yeah, he would be good as a Jackal and Hyde as well. Man. Also, though, it's kind of funny when you think this was his first and and probably only ever true horror movie. Yeah, which is funny when you think all his movies have horror and gothic elements. Yeah. But I suppose that's nearly what makes his movies interesting is the fact that he brings those elements to the kind of movies that usually wouldn't have it or be associated with it. It's so good, like, with, with, like, Tim Burton. Say you didn't know about this film and you're just, like, at home, like, flicking through the channels and, like, on terrestrial TV, not, like, Sky, because it would come up, like, Sleepy Hollow. 
tell you, you how far yeah, in yeah, you yeah, are yeah, and you can press yeah, info. You, you could just you could just turn it on. And like even from the first sequences, if if you got to it, you know when he cuts off um gay uncle Monty's head? Yeah. And there's like the scarecrow. Or secondly, when he throws the pumpkin. Yeah. You can just know straight away, oh, this is Tim Burton. Well, it's really funny you <laughs> said that. Do you know what I mean? Because like... that was when I first came across it. It was late night, you know, you're flicking through on your little box telly in your room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For one to five. One to five, yeah, yeah. And I uh, it was probably Channel 4, I reckon, because it definitely had breaks. But I just remember, I literally came onto it on that scene. And I remember the head getting cut off and rolling in between Johnny Depp's legs. And just and then when the sword plunges into it as the, he, the headless horseman takes it back into the woods and I remember just being captivated and freaked out at the same time and just like what is this movie yeah one to five and then whenever you cause everyone had the same TVs where you'd put the volume up and it'd be like little green bars yeah. <laughs> going up and down and you'd know exactly yeah. like how many green bars you get before you wake yeah, up yeah 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 another oh, thing is remember it. when movies used to have half an hour breaks for the news Oh, that was what was so, that about? Especially on Channel Five. Yeah, it'd be, it'd like, be like earthquake will continue <laughs> after blah blah blah. It will be like it would get to like eleven, and then it would have like a half an hour like break, and you'd be like, oh for fuck's sake! Yeah, you'd be li- and you just you wouldn't even be bothered about the movie at the end of it because you just ruined the whole pace. And you couldn't even do anything, Declan, because at that time when we were being young. Like, you couldn't actually leave your room because you'd yeah. have to, like, sneak about. Cause yeah. Because you'd be like, yeah, what are you doing? <laughs> do you know what I mean? So what the memorable nostalgia. moments do you have? For me, is when he cuts into the tree with all the blood coming out. Yeah, it's a That fact. always strikes me it's as a beautiful set. The memorable... And just in general, like, as we've touched on the sets. But I'd also like to touch on the, the music by Danny Elfman mm. really makes it. Like, yeah. Especially the chase scene where it's like, like building up to a proper crescendo as well and it's like such a perfect marriage of mm. like Tim Burton and Danny Elfman. Danny Elfman like, was it, absolutely crushing it during this It era. just feeds into the whole yeah. like, gothic style. Like I was like, perfect. fucking hell. I mean, who was going to be picked other than Danny Elfman, you know, after the beautiful work he did on A Nightmare Before Christmas? Yeah, yeah, no one. No. For me, the whole movie, the whole look and feel of the movie is just perfect and otherworldly and it always captivated me and interested me ever since I was a kid. You know, it's that same feeling a fairy tale is supposed to have on you when you're a kid where it's terrifying but you're fascinated by it. But if I had to pick out particular scenes, I've got to say, any time the Headless Horseman actually has a head... Christopher Walken uh, yeah. never speaks, but it's for me. This is might be my favorite role of his he's ever done. He is so visually perfect, and they obviously, you know, they t- take his hair up a notch and give him jarred, cut up, and spiky teeth. And I'm pretty sure he has crazy contact lenses on, but it's all his look. Like he naturally has just such a disturbing, terrifying, piercing way about him. And the scenes of him cutting off revolutionaries' heads and running into battle and hiding in the woods. It's just amazing. I want to see a spin-off prequel with just him before he became the Headless Horseman. But other than that, you know, the whole film is fantastic. Easily recommended. You know, it's a Tim Burton classic before he went off, you know, a bit off the boil in his later years. This is him at his pomp making his most Tim Burton-y sort of movie ever. Yeah. So, easy recommendation for Sleepy Hollow. This is the Filmy McFilm Film Show.